Well, good morning. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this meeting of the Government in Audit <coughs> and Standards Committee. Uh, I'm Leo Madden, I'm chair of the committee. Uh, I have to draw your attention to the following. A bit of housekeeping. If there continues fire alarm signs, please evacuate the room and public gallery by the stairwells. Do not attempt to use the lifts. Please assemble at the turning point at the end of King Henry Street, past the University's Park Building. In order to comply with the Guildhall Trust Fire Marshal Regulations, if you signed into the Guildhall, please remember to sign out when you leave the building after today's meeting. Uh, live stri web streaming. My driver wants attention to the fact that this meeting will be live streamed. Can I please remind all attendees to turn the microphones on to speak, and then again once you have finished speaking, and then off again, obviously. Uh, members of the public are also permitted to record the meeting on the understanding that it neither disrupts the meeting nor records those stating explicitly that they do not wish to be recorded. Please be advised that the public seating area is not in view of the camera used to website this <coughs> meeting. So we'll go around the table now and uh, introduce ourselves, if that's all right. Can I start with you, Emily, please? I'm Councillor Emily Shodwick. I represent the Hilsey Ward. Uh, Mary Valley, Councillor for uh, Cashewan Murmuring, and I'm here instead of Graham Heaney. Richard Webb, Deputy Director of Finance. James Harris, Senior Local Democracy Officer. Thank you. Uh, Pitbull, City Solicitor. Elizabeth Goodwin, Chief Internal Auditor. Paul Somerset, Deputy Chief Internal Auditor. Atty Rama Pearl, Chief Executive. And Kelly Nash, Corporate Performance Manager. Thank you. Well, thank you all. I think that's all. Are we expecting any more officers? No, I think I said. Okay, thank you very much. Um, could I welcome Emily uh, to the first meeting? Um, George has now stepped down from the meeting to be a standing deputy, so that could be really exciting for him. Um, could I also uh, welcome Kadir uh, and Mary, who are standing in uh, for the respective people. And could I also. Uh, Welcome our Chief Executive, uh, Natalie Brown and Pearl. I, I have not seen a Chief Executive this meeting for about 20 years, so it's, it's nice to see you. I, I don't expect you to appear at every meeting, Natalie, but thank you very much for turning up. Thank you. Uh, members, any interest? No, okay. Okay, thank you. Can we do the minutes of the meeting of the 20th of September, please? Okay, for accuracy and matters arising. I know there was only, only me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah, I've got to change all the minutes. It's just uh, I've just have a few matters arising. That's all. Um, I don't know, Richard. You wouldn't have a, on this thing about the um, external audit about the backlog. Would you have any additional information on that? The backlog that they have got. Uh, you know. So. Um, Thank you, Chair. Um, we, um, sorry, sorry, <coughs> I should have said page six, um, second paragraph from the bottom, sorry. Yes, now we were going to update you uh, shortly, um, as we discussed um, yesterday, um, that we normally present the annual accounts to you around September to November uh, time of year. Um, it normally aligns with the issuing of the audit opinion. Um, that has currently been delayed due to the national delays that you refer to. Um, the 21-22 audit is still underway, and the 22-23 has not formally started yet, as I understand. So we are looking at when the best time would be for you to present the annual accounts to you. Uh, I was more interested if you knew anything from the external auditor, Richard. Not the um, no, no further updates on that at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, page nine, then, um, the second paragraph. This was when we were talking about you know, unreasonable customer behaviour. And uh, the question was asked about whether councillors could do anything about it when they've got unreasonable customers. Um, that was been taken away. I don't. Does anybody know anything about whether any there's any update on that? I'm just looking at you and Kelly. I don't know why, but I, I think it's just habit, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, I think if I recall rightly, that report was presented by Charlotte, and I'm very happy to follow up with colleagues and communications and to allow them to come back. Okay, thank you.
On page on page ten, it's, it's just a reminder. That's all. It, it, with the internal audit report, and we we you, we must be getting a bit fed up with this. But nevertheless, it's, it's the important issue of school to home to school transport. Um, you weren't particularly satisfied. I, I, any, I, I want to make sure it's kept on the agenda until you're happy with it. But is, have you seen any improvement on that? Yes, councillor. We have actually shifted our assurance level from limited to reasonable. But what we agreed we would also do is we would keep it in the annual plan so that we can have oversight regarding the control arrangements. But yes, it has moved in the right direction. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, do, do <laughs> how do we do with this then, since I'm the only one here from the last meeting? I agree. I agree. The minutes. Am I allowed to do that? Yep. Well, <laughs> you know, it's, I know. I know it's a bit, bit silly, but nevertheless, I, I agree. The minutes. But is that, is that enough? Yeah. I mean, as a body, the committee members, um, whoever's in attendance, is the committee who agrees the minutes. So, if you, as the sole member who was at the last meeting, is happy with them, um, it's a matter for the committee members whether they wish to agree them as well. But um, it, it's, a, it's a body decision. Uh, anyway, that's the minute. Uh, I'm, I'm going to sign them off. And um, if there's a challenge, I'll be in the High Court with everybody else. Okay, thank you. Okay, can we do um, corporate performance report uh, the 2002-2003 quarter two? Kelly, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report comes as part of an ongoing sequence of reports that comes each quarter and broadly seeks to provide assurance to the committee that there are processes in place for the organisation to be um, determining reasonable levels of performance they should be delivering and that it is then tracking those and taking appropriate action where there is an issue of concern. What we do is share the report with members of the cabinet so that they're um, fully aware of areas that they need to be following up with officers and ensuring actions are in place. And then, as I say, we present this to this committee to give full assurance as part of our control framework there is something in place that means that we are tracking our performance around our business as usual, but also managing our large capital and transformational projects. Um, in terms of particular themes that we would draw out with the report, which you will see is presented according to our corporate plan priorities, we would just highlight there are particular issues around workforce that are causing concern across a number of those indicators, and that is something that obviously there are plans in place to address those across the range of particular professions that it involves. I think you should also probably note that that workforce issue isn't just simply within PCC, but is also within our partner organisations as some of our contractors are experiencing those challenges as well, and that's obviously having an impact too. But as I say, in terms of the broad report, we present this to give you assurance that there are processes in place to manage performance in accordance with the control framework set out in our annual governance statement. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Generally, um, as you would expect, I don't necessarily know the detail of all the issues that are in the report, but very happy to follow any of those up if you wanted further information and return them outside of the committee. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kelly. Yeah, I mean, quite a lot of red, aren't they? I suppose, they, and I think I've said this before, there's, they, they sort of merge into one another, don't they? The greens and the reds and the ambers, because some of them are not quite red. Some are not quite, you know what I mean, it's, 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 it's direction of travel, is it? The writing was a bit small for me, Kelly, I have to say, on the, uh, but yeah, well, you know, my eyes, my eyes are not the writing to the world. However, so I might have missed something, but just, just on the uh, page, I don't know what page numbers you've got, Ellie, um, Kelly, but page 21, the first, um, the first priority, improve the lives of our residents. It's just little things like, um, the second paragraph, uh, we have seen more care experienced young people living in appropriate accommodation as a result of joint initiatives between children's service and housing service. That's a fine statement. But is it any... I don't see what, how many. I mean, I don't know if it's gone off from one to two or, or is this a significant improvement. I couldn't find it amongst the diagrams. Um, have you any idea? It is. But it's not actually a huge number in and of its own, uh, own right. Um, what I'll do is we'll come back to the committee with details of the numbers that are yes. in proportions, but also the training numbers so you get a sense of how that's risen over time. It's really happy to do that. Yeah, I mean, other bits give figures. 
Uh, what it was and what it should yes. be. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I looked at the uh, on the. Um, if you look, just ju I'm just seeing these examples because there's, there's there's a lot of work in there. And there's a lot of good work, and and uh, I, I'm happy with the way it's been presented. But if you look at page 25, and, and it's just it's just a comment. Uh, and the third one down is about number of children in care returning in a planned way. Okay, now this shows two reds, Kelly, but it seems to me to be um, understating it in the sense our programme to support children to return home when safe to do so is now established and supported by uh, adult family safeguarding workers. I think I've said this before, sometimes who, who gives these... Who gives these um, the, the, the traffic light colours. That's not your good self. That's presumably whoever's done the report. Or are some of us understating? Are some staff understating themselves? Because that doesn't seem to me to be a red. I think you know. I mean, sometimes the greens might and shouldn't be greens either. Or it might be ambers. But that sort of thing. What? Yeah. Do, do, what in your, I'm just asking you. Do you think that's a red, or could it be another colour? I think the directorate have considered that to be a red because it's a really important part of the program around um, creating strong stable families that children returned home as far, far as they possibly can be and I think the department would consider themselves disappointed if they're not being able to secure as many of those arrangements as they possibly can so I think if they consider that to be below where they would want to be and um, taking account of the work they're doing and the plans that they're putting in place for young those young people it's fair for them to say that of course the issues around family reunification are very complex and difficult and there's probably huge stories that go on beyond that but clearly the um, d director I feel there's more they could be doing in that area in respect of keeping those families together and of course ultimately reducing the reliance on external mm. placements so I think it's right for them to assess it that way if that's where they feel they are. Yeah, well, I think they're silly. You know, I, I mean, I do think when you're doing, I think it's very difficult you, uh, if you're hitting yourself um, on the head because, you know, when it, when it appears to me to be going a different direction. However, because uh, it's a public document as well, isn't it? Um, uh, I had lots more, but I'm not going to... I just wanted the trend of things on things, how they're going. Uh, any comments, ma'am? Any questions? OK, thank you very much. Uh, Kelly, thank you, yeah. And what we've got to do now, I keep forgetting to do this. Um, we note the, the report in, in, in the revised format. I, remember, uh, I think nobody else will have seen this report before, other than me, but it, it was, thanks to Kelly, much improved, I have to say, right? So I, I, I do like the revised format. Uh, and also, do we agree, we agree if any further action is required in response to performance highlighted? No, I haven't highlighted down here. You're just going to go and have a look on some of the questions I've read. But just a general thing, that's all, Kelly, yeah? So agree the recommendations, members? Thank you very much. Thank you. I would now come to item five, Treasury Management, Mid-Year Review 2023-24. Helen. Okay, thank you, Chair. So this is the Midterm Treasury Management Report, as at the 30th of September. And this report comes to the committee for scrutiny and will then go on to cabinet and full council. So we continue to operate within our authorised limits and indicators that were approved by council in March 23. <coughs> Excuse me. During quarter two, we have undertaken no new borrowing. Our gross balance of borrowing as at the 30th of September was 740 million. The value of our investments for the same period was 401 million. The returns on our investments continue to be higher than expected due to the increase in interest rates currently. And as a continuation from quarter one, the council has sufficient liquidity to meet our obligations as they arise. I'd like to provide some uh, greater clarity around table five um, on the report. Um, just for, uh, for understanding, uh, the vanilla interest-bearing deposit is a cash deposit that earns interest. So it's not a complex um, financial instrument as both the traded structure and externally managed funds are. With regards to the externally managed funds, you'll see that the annualised return is currently minus 1.44%. 
that this is a notional value and when it returns to us in 25, 26, this will come back at full value. Also, with regards to the externally managed fund, the value actually is 13 million and not 11 million, which then shows that the total average value for all of the funds provided there will be 418 million, which is in line with where it's been referenced elsewhere in the report. Um, we're happy to take any questions. Sorry, what page is that on? Uh, uh, wait, wait, wait. 65. 65, which, yeah. Um. It's around our in investment activity. We, do, we, we don't have the, the different tables numbered as such. You said four or five, I can't remember what oh, you It's under section yes. A5. I will pick that up for next time and make sure it's the okay. Yeah, are yeah, just, it's just for me. I met with Helen and uh, Richard yesterday, so uh, the points that I'm not concerned, but I mean, I raised yesterday. So, any members, any questions, any uh, points on this? No. no happy enough? No. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, all we need, uh, thank you, Helen. Thank you. Richard. Um, it's recommended that Treasuries, the Council's Treasury Management Activity should remain, uh, is noted, uh, remain within the Treasury Management Policy 23-24 up to 30 September and the actual Treasury Management indicates, Indicators as of 20 September as set out in Appendix A. Is that noted, members? Yeah. Very happy with that? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we now move to item six, internal audit performance status report to 7th of September, sorry, 7th of November 2023. Lucy. Thank you, Chair. Chair, for the benefit of any new members to the committee, on a regular basis, we will bring to this committee any items of work that we have completed and we'll give you a summarised version. The original plan would have been approved again by this committee early on in the year. So what is contained in the report is a narrative around are we on track to complete the work that has been scheduled and the answer to that is yes and there is some statistical information around what is in progress and what has been completed. We also are duty bound to give you any additional information around activities that sometimes sit outside of audit, sometimes sit within audit, which are also narrated within the report to give you a flavour for the other activities that we cover <coughs> that all generally contribute to the annual opinion which is given approximately July each year on the internal control framework. What is quite specific though for a progress report is for you to have the information on the items that we've completed which is from section 8 onwards or page 80 onwards. There is nothing within this report that is of significant concern, but obviously there are some areas where there are some risk exposures. Each item of work that we perform, the relevant internal parties have a number of actions that they we will agree that they're going to put in place to mitigate that risk. And as an example, on page 80 for the food health and safety, the agreed action implementation dates that have been attributed to that piece of work is for December. Chair, we also include any follow-up work that we've performed where it would have been attributed an assurance level and we want to ascertain whether the agreed actions have been implemented and whether they've been agree whether they've been implemented effectively. Those are at the latter stages of the report, and if the assurance level improves, then obviously that is included. Beyond that, at present, I'm happy to answer any questions in relation to the specific audits that are included within this progress report presented to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lizzie. Lizzie, could I just, um, if you go to page 80, I would just look, as I always do, I look at the high ones rather than the medium ones. Right, but it's just, um, <laughs> that's my reading of it. I'm not reading it at all. The second, uh, so the, 
this is on the food, uh, food Health and Safety Director of Culture. And two high risk uh, exceptions were raised in relation, blah, 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 blah. This line was highlighted as either making contact uh, alter than the required framework. That doesn't seem English to me, but uh, after. Is it after? And then and delete and, and delete Dan. Yes. <laughs> All right. God Almighty, I had sleepless nights over there. Um, I thought it was after. No, 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 it's just one of those um, things. Uh, the the second one, the next one, page eighty one. It's interesting, isn't it? Because um, the first line talks about management of damp and mould across the authority. We're actually doing a scrutiny panel uh, on that at the minute. Uh, and there's not much information coming out of it. Um, so I was interested to see that, that um, you know, they were taken because they hadn't been dealt with properly, they were taken seriously, and that's good. Very interested in that. Um, I don't think I'll just look at members. Any questions on this? I've highlighted a lot here, Lizzie, but it's not, it's only because I, I know you're on the ball, and I know you're getting on with it, but um, let me see, I'll just. Uh, Okay, can we look at page 86 and car, hire cars? I thought we'd done away with these, so there you are, I'm old-fashioned. Um, there's, there's, there's a bit of uh, carrot and stick in this one, isn't there? Yeah, which is good. I haven't seen this before. I haven't seen this, you know, if you don't, if you don't do what you're told, you'll not get a car. Um, why, would, why, why, why would people not carry out whatever they, they need to do in order to get a hire car? This specifically relates to the fact that when, and there are a number of vehicles that we do hire on a regular basis, that we do a pre and post check that the vehicle is not damaged in any way. And, and I would perhaps put it down to urgency of summer visits, you know, conducting normal business as usual, not necessarily recognising that there is a requirement to do certain standard checks. And the implications are that if we don't, and the hire company allege that we've damaged their car, if we can't evidence that we have checked before or after, obviously then that causes us a, a problem. I, I think it is day-to-day -day activities. Beyond that, I don't have any other rationale as to why simple checks can't be performed. What we have done, though, is we've worked clearly with the service that manages the cars, and they had some issues with a couple of the directorates that predominantly use the higher vehicles for genuine reasons, and we've actually taken it to the director. And I had a notification quite recently to say of all of the additional arrangements that have been put in place because they recognise that if we keep being challenged, if there is an issue with a car, it is costing the authority and they, they recognise that they need to have the relevant controls and arrangements in place. So we should see an improved movement. Okay, thank you, Lucy. Have any questions or comments? Please. Uh, one, can I just say that this kind of the way it's led out is great because it makes it a lot easier. Um, I don't obviously I've not watched this committee before, but with the actions, what happens if they don't complete them within that time frame? So there are various colour codes for the actions. If there is a critical risk exception, we need to follow up within a three month period, and the client would have determined actions within that three month period as well. For anything else we follow up the following year and any of the agreed actions we will agree a date and if we think that date is too far in the distance then we will have a discussion um, and negotiate a better time frame. When we follow up if there is something that is outstanding then obviously we can't communicate back to you but we need to understand why the service hasn't been able to do it, whether perhaps uh, the agreed action potentially wasn't quite fit for purpose, um, or the risk exposure, we need to go down a different path. So we can alter sometimes and say, well, that didn't quite work, and we'll do it again. So we will follow up, 
the service themselves obviously have oversight as to what's working, what's not working, and we can amend. And the only final thing I think to probably just throw into the mix is when I say there's agreed actions, the audit service at <coughs> Portsmouth don't dictate what a service should do. What we do is we sit down with the service and we say, we believe there's a risk exposure, are we in agreement that there's a risk exposure? You know your service better than what we would. What do you think you need to put in place? Um, so that's where sometimes the action that has been proposed doesn't quite address the overall exposure, but it is monitored until the issue was resolved. So with, so like on page 85, there's obviously, you've got two, you've got um, like field work services. It, originally it said there was a high and then a follow up. Is that because they've agreed that it's not high anymore? Or it's because you've resolved it, or it's just that someone else has reassessed it? We've gone back, we've retested, they implemented the actions, and it has now reduced the risk exposure. Okay. Okay, members. Okay, can we, um, can we then, we have to ask to note the order performance for 23 24 to the 7th of November and the highlighted areas of concern in relation to audits completed for the 22-23 audit plan, including follow-up work performed. Is that agreed, members? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I've laughed at the ripper, the ripper policy. Uh, I think you, you gave me a big doorstop there, didn't you, in, uh, in relation to the policy bit, Paul, but, um, yeah, I'll hand over to you, Paul. Ripper, sorry, I've forgotten the full name of it, but it's on the papers. Yep, so Ripper is the Regulatory Investigatory Powers Act, and under, as a local authority, we have powers under this act to authorise directed surveillance or the use of a CHIS, which is a, which is a covert human intelligence source. Um, we bring back to this committee the, uh, any use we have of uh, our Ripper powers. And also, this paper contains the results in a, of an investigation that we have um, under from IPCO there, the Investigatory Powers Commissioner's Office. On an approximately three-year cycle, they come in and inspect our use of the powers just to make sure that we're using them in compliance with the legislation. And you'll see that they were uh, happy with uh, how we use them. We had one minor point where we authorised a ripper for a one-month period, when in theory it should have been three months. So it was a, it was a very minor minor issue. Um, We've had two RIPRA applications authorised uh, since we last brought this back to the committee in January 2021. Um, and then lastly, there is, as the Chair mentioned, a very healthy policy at the back. Um, we've highlighted it in yellow, the changes we've, we've made. We uh, engaged the use of a consultant to help us with our policy to make sure it is completely uh, in line with the legislation that is there to protect. Um, happy to take any questions. The highlights are in black for us, Paul. Yeah. Um, I was just the one four three. I mean, I, I read it, you know, and it's interesting the, the, the policy and all the rest of it. But four three, two RIPA applications have been authorised during the period 6th of January 2001 to the 8th of November 2023. That's nearly three years and only two. Well, why is that? And, and, and is it cost effective? Uh, the threshold for uh, application of RIPA being authorised is very high. Um, I can't remember the, the exact time, but many years ago they changed it. So the offence that you have to investigate has to have a, a minimum of a six-month custodial sentence, which then moved a lot of the offences that local authorities previously used RIPA for out of, of the remit. So that's generally why is that we don't really investigate things that would meet the threshold often. And the threshold is very high due to the uh, potential risks of authorising directed surveillance. It's just my cynicism, that's all. We haven't got loads of staff sitting twiddling their thumbs for the last three years, have we? No, so any use of Ripper would be part of... It's not someone's dedicated job to do these time of investigations, depending on the department and what they use. They would come to the authorising officers to apply for a uh, authorisation of directed surveillance. So, no, this, it's, it wouldn't impact... The lack of applications doesn't impact on people's day-to-day -day work. Thank you for that assurance, Paul. Members, any questions? Any points? Okay, now we'll move to the <laughs> move to the vote. We never vote here at all, but um, 
So item 7, that uh, to we note the desktop inspection carried out by IPCO surveillance inspector and results presented. Uh, secondly, that there have been two RIPA applications authorised since the last report to the committee on the 15th of January 2021. And three, the changes highlighted within the policy following legislative changes. Okay, members? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move on to the one that used to be very exciting. Um, uh, item 8, compliance with gifts and hospitality register. This comes to us every year, members, so, so you can have a, a good look at it. And, uh, well, I, 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 I'll present. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Oh, it's yourself, Peter. Oh, it is. Well, sorry, Peter. Yes. That's all right. The floor is yours. Yeah, as, as a sort of pre Christmas treat, I'll just trot you through the uh, yearly um, gifts and hospitality. Interestingly, this year it's been sort of fairly slow. Um, the interesting highlights for your good selves are that we've had um, 112 gifts registered relevant to staff, which is actually probably lower than usual. And if you look at them, they tend to be in the same sort of places in the sense of um, housing, neighbourhood buildings, that type of thing. Adult social care, there's special rules applicable to them relevant to £5 only. Our limits are very low in the sense of under £25 and £40 of hospitality. In terms of um, members' gifts, we've only actually had one this year. So it's extremely low, so there are no issues really relevant to that, and that's perfectly in order. Nothing terribly exciting above that. The usual ones are slightly um, potentially contentious, but they aren't this year, are relevant to the port, and we've had very few of those this year. So it's been a, um, a well-declared and within policy and process um, set of gifts and hospitality this year. Um, any questions? Thank you. I see a single pair somewhere. You okay? Pair. Was there a pair in here somewhere? Could you put your. Oh, sorry, sorry, Mary, yeah. What? Does somebody receive a pair? A pair. A P E A R. <laughs> it could be. May could well be have done. I, I, never, I never put that one up. May well have done because it's an annex to the report is actually what most of, yeah. of the gifts are and what tends to happen is if anything like biscuits or chocolates are distributed amongst staff anything terribly exciting goes to the Lord Mayor's um, charity fund um, so if a pair has been disclosed that's probably quite sort of um, overkill really I was going to say I, I would have done that rubbish <laughs> joke as well but there you Um, I've been corrected by my learned friend to my left. It's actually, in fact, a large bag of pears. Yes, I saw that one. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, well, I'd like to say the dog chews weren't distributed amongst staff, but there you go. Any other questions on that? I mean, I just say, um, you know, as I've said every year, this reflects wonderfully on our staff. You know, they, they do do, you know, if you particularly look at the, the uh, social services, you know, and, and people want to give gifts. And the problem is, because I, I had gifts in the past from uh, people who thought I'd done a, a good job for them, um, bottles of whiskey and such like, but I've, I've given those to the Lord Mayor's Appeal. But I've told the people that I've asked the people. I've tried to give it back again. So it is difficult. It is difficult, particularly you know, social services have a, which I've fought with them in the past, a, a limit of five pounds. Which you know, I mean, infl there's been there's been like that for years, you know. But it's, it's the checks and balances, isn't it? Um, but what I'm saying is, in the, it's the ones that haven't been recorded that will worry me. And and uh, you know, we 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 never know those, but. You know, I think I think it, it looks good for the staff, and I think people behave properly, and I think the judgments that are made at the end of the day uh, are very fair and appropriate. So, on hospitality, what have we got to do? Recommend that the committee considers whether or not to make any recommendations. Well, we haven't, and in the absence of any changes, that the report is noted. Okay, members. Thank you. Here we're, we're on to the. Uh, the hardy chestnut, which uh, Peter will explain. This is the proportionality bit. It's the um, consideration of the political balance rules in relation to the constitution of subcommittees 
considering complaints against members. Just a bit of an explanation there. For yeah. New members. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, every year I apply to this committee um, for an exemption to apply the uh, proportionality rules. Now, under Section 17 and 18 of the Local Government Act 1989, I should appoint committees relevant to a political balance to deal with things in a committee structure, for example. Now, given that I have a political balance and a limited number of members that can do filtering panels and deal with gas, I approach this committee every year for um, an exemption to apply the rules as, as far as reasonably practicable, which is what the Act says under Section 17. Okay? So I invite you to unanimously agree that I can disapply them so that I can therefore be able to service the in, in, initial filtering panels and any gas committee that may or may not hear a member complaint. So I invite you upon submission to make that um, unanimous declaration today. Thank you. Yeah, okay. And in fact, what we're trying to do is to make sure that the, the three members that were sitting in the panel are from different parties. Yes, we do, as far as reasonably practicable. Um, but I have a limited stable for all manner of reasons from whom to pick. And James and myself struggle with getting enough numbers of independent members or members that are relevant to deal with these, these, these committees. Hence my application every year um, for the last 10 years, 15 years. OK, thank you. So we've got to agree this, uh, uh, um, and not anonymously, but uh, uh, unanimously, um, for some reason. That's um, yeah. That is the section 18 um, exit. So, okay, members for this. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, members, thank you very much then. Um, I think our next meeting is sometime in January, so thank you very much uh, for coming. Thank you.